Hello everyone, uh, my name is Salman Razavi from Global Institute for Water Security and this week I'd like to welcome you to the seventh week of this year's breakthrough, uh, sorry, distinguished lecture series in breakthroughs for or in water security. Uh, as always I'd like to welcome our simulcast viewers, in particular our students in Beijing Un Normal University in China and again as an option simulcast viewers can ask questions by emailing me directly at Salman Razavi, so it's salman.razavi at usask.ca. I'll do my best to ask your questions on your behalf. So please do send your questions. Uh, and of course, later on, yeah, the videos are going to be available on YouTube for people to watch. There's a sign up sheet again for MWS students, so make sure to write your name. And as always, I'd like to thank. Jay Familiati, John Pomeroy, Global Water Future Program for underwriting this seminar series and providing support. So this week it's great pleasure to welcome Professor Nandita Basu to Saskatoon. Nandita is an associate professor and university research chair at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Waterloo. She received her PhD in environmental engineering in 2006 from Purdue University and after two years as a postdoc uh, at the University of Florida and then Purdue University, she started a faculty position at the University of Iowa in 2009. Then she joined Waterloo uh, in 2013, January, just a couple of months before me leaving the University of Waterloo. So she, we had very short overlap and you know, I wasn't lucky enough to get to know her much, although I remember, so because she had back then two offices, one in civil engineering, one in earth science, and I remember, yeah, I stopped by her office a few times back then to introduce myself, but of course she was in the other office all the time. So, but yeah, of course under GWF I had the privilege to interacting, uh, uh, to interact with her, and of course it's great to have her here now. Yeah, Nandita is a leading scientist in eco-hydrology and nutrient modeling. And last night we had a good conversation on what eco-hydrology really means. And probably, probably she's going to provide more insight in her talk. And um, she is internationally recognized for her contributions to water sustainability in human impacted environments. In particular, her work has led to new understanding of the long-term effects of fertilizers on water quality, and in particular nutrient legacies. And basically, she's providing insight on why some of the uh, uh, new initiatives to, to prevent or to clear up some of our water resources are not that successful because of all these nutrient legacies that have been accumulated over the years. So on the service level, she has been an active contributor to different in international associations and initiatives. Uh, in particular, I witnessed my first hand myself that she's been the chair of Water Quality Technical Committee uh, of AGU, hydrology section, and in that capacity also interacted with her a bit uh, as I was running the other technical committee of AGU. Uh, she's been on editorial boards of multiple journals, including Water Resources Research and HES, uh, and I think others. And of course, for all their all her great contributions and service she's been uh, recognized by several awards and recognition. So most recently in 2019, she's been named a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and, Sci uh, and Scientists. Congratulations, Nandita, for that great recognition. And of course, uh, many others like uh, Ontario Early Researcher Award or Kwaji uh, Young Career Fellowship. So without any further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Nandita to Saskatoon. And yeah, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Saman. Um, and thank you, Global Water Futures and GIWS, uh, John, Jay, Jeff McDonald, all of you for inviting me uh, to give this talk. It is really an honor. Uh, to be here talking uh, to an amazing group of hydrologists and uh, ecosystem scientists. I wanted to talk to you today about uh, our research on 
nutrient modeling, how nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus move through landscapes, and with the overall goal of how can we manage our landscapes to protect our water quality. So more and more as uh, in my last few years of research, I've, I've found myself more and more motivated from, from the perspective of how can we protect our waters, how can we manage our landscape to protect our streams and lakes, and that uh, will be in essence the focus of my talk. But of course, the other big part of research is students. Uh, you are the reason we are here, and you are what makes it so much fun. Uh, so I wanted to start by thanking my amazing group of students. You also see Emily, who's uh, one of you over here in that picture, because this picture was taken when Emily visited us this summer uh, to work on the Prairie Water Project. Uh, our, the research in our group is broadly categorized in three areas. So the first is w uh, data synthesis. So here we look at water quality data across scales and using various machine learning and other techniques, we try to quantify how climate and land use affects water quality across scales. And some of you might be familiar with ideas of top-down modeling, and our water quality modeling is inspired by this idea of top-down modeling. So we start with data, really understand the data, and from the data we learn enough to develop models of systems. I won't go into a lot uh, in that area of, of our work today, though you will see some glimpses of it, focus a lot of my talk today on the second area of our research, which is this idea of land use legacies and water quality. So in essence, the idea of this work is how past land use activity impacts the quality of the water, water quality that we see today. What is the, what is the role of that past in current water quality? And I will talk a little bit about this third area that is emerging as an area um, that we are very interested in our group. And, and part of that motivation started um, uh, three years ago with the Global Water Future. So thinking about the solution scape, what is the value of all these models that we do? How can these models be used to uh, manage our landscapes uh, but, uh, better? In terms of uh, landscapes, I'll talk quite a bit about the Great Lakes Basins, where we currently focus a lot of our research, but I will also draw in from our earlier work in the Mississippi River Basin, as well as uh, some work in the Chesapeake Bay watersheds. So if you think about algal blooms, where algae has been in the news, um, this summer, last summer, pretty much the last few years, consistently talking about toxic algal blooms in Lake Erie, uh, public health uh, warnings in the shores of Lake Ontario, uh, incidences of pets being killed due to toxic algal blooms. So there are stories everywhere that you see. Here's um, something that happened in uh, the city of Toledo in 2014. Some of you might be aware of it. There were these algal blooms that were so huge that the drinking water treatment plant had to be shut down because water that was coming out looked kind of like that. So it is a really big problem, and this problem is increase, has increased in the last few years. Here's just another example of um, Lake Erie algal bloom. So CyanoTracker tracks algal blooms in the lake, and uh, just this summer, uh, this is the number of incidences of algal bloom sightings, and this, this list might even be smaller than the latest. So it's huge, and this year has been one of the worst years for algal blooms. Of course, when things like this happen, people come together and try to do something about it, and this is true in this case too. Um, US and Canada have gotten together and have said, well, we are going to work to reduce phosphorus to the lake uh, by 40%. So phosphorus is, in, in, in freshwater systems, we generally think of phosphorus as being the leading cause of algal blooms. However, there's controversies around it, there's the role of nitrogen, I'm not going to go into any of that today. So we've decided that we are going to cut uh, the phosphorus by 40% by 2040. And as part of the Lake Futures Project, funded through the Global Water Futures Program, some of the questions we are asking is, is this a realistic target? Can we reduce it by 40%? How long will it take? What are the costs and benefits? So let's, before going into a lot of the detail, let's just first look at the landscape in the Lake Erie Basin. So this is all the land that drains into the Lake Erie and uh, on the Canadian side. And what you see in yellow is agricultural land. So mostly dominated by agriculture, some urban areas that you see. 
one of the first things that you need to know when you think about these systems is what's coming in, what's going out. Simple mass balance, we always start with the simple thing. So in this case, if you look at mass balance of nutrients in the, in the Great Lakes Basin, what you see over here, so this is phosphorus, so everything in blue, and so this is mass balance done from 1900s to now. Again, we talk of legacy, so we really have to do these long-term mass balances. One of the things that jumps out is that manure phosphorus is a big component of the mass budget. The other thing that jumps out is fertilizer P, at least since the 1950s, is a big, large component of the budget. The other thing is the domestic phosphorus is a smaller component of the phosphorus budget. That's because this is primarily an agriculture dominated landscape. And also because we've gotten really good. The wastewater treatment plants we have have really sophisticated technology, so we treat most of that waste. What you see in negative over here is crop phosphorus export. So this is the major source of phosphorus out of the system. What is really interesting is this black line over here, which is what we call the phosphorus surplus. So it's what you're adding to the landscape minus what you're taking out of the landscape. So ideally, you would want this phosphorus surplus to be really, really low, because that's the phosphorus that's added to the landscape that is not taken up by the crop. So it is potentially sitting there waiting for your rainstorm to come and wash it into the lake. What you note over here is it's never zero, it's a positive value, but it peaked in the 1970s. So we are doing better than before. We have gotten more efficient at using the phosphorus that we apply on the landscape. And that's because of agricultural technologies. Our crop varieties have improved. So for the same fertilizer application, our crop export is more and we are more efficient. However, the other thing that you, I want you to note is that there is this extra phosphorus that has built up in the landscape. And this is what we call the legacy. So even if we are doing better than before, all that phosphorus phosphorus is there still hiding somewhere in our watershed. So when we make a change, if we reduce this phosphorus surplus even more, the legacy phosphorus has to be depleted before uh, we see an improvement in water quality. And why is it important to think about this? Well, this is something that came out in CBC News uh, two years ago, uh, and this is a place close to home. Uh, Five-year fight removes less than 1% of the phosphorus in the Lake Winnipeg Basin, despite $18 million being spent. And this story about a lot of money being spent but nothing really happening is not unique to this part of the world. So I'm going to take you all across Canada now to the Gulf of Mexico, and here the hypoxic zone or the algal blooms are caused by nitrogen, not phosphorus. But the story is similar. So what you see here is hypoxic area in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is again is caused by excess nitrogen running off from agricultural fields. And you see the hypoxic area goes up and down. This is driven by climate. And this is 2017, which had one of the largest dead zones or hypoxic area in the last 32 years. It was as large as the, uh, as the state of New Jersey that year. Now, again, people have been doing things in the landscape. In 2008, the Gulf of Mexico Hypoxia Task Force was formed. And they said, we will reduce the size of the hypoxic zone to 5,000 kilometers square by 2015. 2015 came and went. Guess what the size was? You can kind of see it over here. It's 16,000 kilometers square. Right? Uh, and now what we have done is we have extended to the goal to 2035. Why 2035? Do we know that we will be able to achieve in a, it in 2035? No. It's far enough away that we don't have to think about it. And that's how we set goals uh, in a lot of our water quality issues. <laughs> Similar thing in uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So the Chesapeake Bay watershed is in the northeastern US. Again, uh, huge problems of hypoxic area. In 1987, the Chesapeake Bay program said, we will reduce uh, nitrogen and phosphorus by 40%. In 2011, they said these goals have not been met. Going across the ocean to groundwater nitrate problems in Germany. So this report talks about the fact, again, that despite a huge amount of money being spent on treating the groundwater nitrate problem in Germany, nothing has really changed. Nitrate concentrations are still as bad as before. Such lack of success generates skepticism, right? Uh, 
if you are there thinking about, well, I've invested all this money and all this energy into implementing various watershed conservation measures, but my water quality isn't getting better. That creates disbelief in people that these things work. I'll give you a small example from when I was in Iowa and I was working with the farmers. So did, we did this farmer questionnaires where we asked them, when you do different types of watershed conservation measures, when do you expect the water quality will be improving? 90% of them said within one to three years they expect to see an improvement. Science tells us otherwise. Science tells us that there are time lags in these system, and even if you make a change today, it will sometimes take decades to have an improvement. However, as scientists, we have not been able to communicate how long it will take. We have not been able to quantify how long it takes. It's this uncertain, hazy thing that nobody wants to talk about and sweep under the rug. And that leads to comments like this, that time lag is a, an excuse for not meeting goals. And this is the space in which a lot of our research fits in, figuring out ways to quantify these, this time lag across landscapes. And even if there is uncertainty in this quantification, trying to get this ballpark estimate of time lag using these different methods so that um, we can have that available when policy and other decisions needed to be made. Okay. So, our overall hypothesis, again, is that intensively managed landscape have these legacy nutrients. And these legacy nutrients have built up over decades of fertilizer application. So when you make a change to the landscape, as you can see, this is the point at which you are making the change, there is this internal memory that has to be depleted before you will see a water quality improvement. So how do we quantify that lag time? So I'm going to start with a really simple way of doing it, something we tested in the Grand River watershed uh, in uh, where I live. What we did in this watershed, again, we always start with something really simple, but difficult to do because census data, agricultural census data are not the easiest to work with, uh, but a um, 100-year mass balance of nitrogen inputs and outputs across the Grand River watershed. And what you see in the black line over here is, the, again, the nitrogen surplus. So two things. There's a positive surplus, so your inputs are much, much greater than your outputs from the system. And the second thing is that the surplus has been decreasing over time. Now let's blow that up. And what you see over here is the nitrogen surplus, the same thing as that. Now I'm focusing on the 1960 to 2010 period. And you see nitrogen surplus is decreasing, so we are getting better at it, right? We are applying less fertilizer and getting more crops out of it. We are getting more efficient. How does the stream nitrate look like in that system? So if I uh, look at stream nitrate, you see stream nitrate has been increasing, and that's scary, right? We are putting in less nitrogen into the system, but the stream nitrate doesn't seem to recognize that, and it's increasing. However, if you waited a little longer, it decreases. And this is this idea of lag time. Here you see in the system, it took about 25 to 30 years for the water quality to get better after the nitrogen surplus peaked. The next question that comes to mind, well, how variable is it across the landscape? So we asked this question across the Grand River watershed. So here is one station, which is the Grand River at Branford. And in this case, this is the nitrogen surplus in blue, and the stream nitrate is these orange diamonds. And it's, you see that the stream nitrate is still increasing, right? So this is an example of really long lag times. And here's a contrasting example where nitrogen surplus has changed and stream nitrate has responded really fast. So this is an example of relatively shorter lag times. Any clues why it might be different that way? So the clue lies in the map behind it, which is the tile density. So in the one system that it responded faster, there was much greater density of tiles. And tile drains are these subsurface drains that route the water very fast through the system. So when you have tiles, you are bypassing the natural landscape's uh, potential to slow down the water. And in fact, this is a clay area. So that's why you put tiles, and which makes it respond much faster. So using this method, you can estimate lag times in various sub-basins within the Grand River watershed, and we found this to vary between 10 to 30 years. 
Now, it's important. I know some of you might be working on things like transit time distributions. One of the things that's important to recognize is that this is different from transit time distributions because it also takes into fact that nitrogen might have a different residence time within the system than water. Because nitrogen, when you add into the system, it can cycle. It's not only present as nitrate. It can cycle through the organic matter pool, and it can stay longer in the system than just water movement. Okay. So this is all about the past. How do we predict lag times in the future? Will they be same? How will they change? So before going into that, I want to talk to you a little bit about our conceptual framework. Again, the main question that we are trying to answer is when you make a change to the landscape, how long does it take for the water quality to respond? In order to make this, uh, in order to understand this, we have to have two pieces of the puzzle. The first piece is simple. It stores. Where is this legacy accumulated? So for nitrogen, you have a lot of legacy that might have accumulated in uh, groundwater, and that we typically call the hydrologic legacy. You can also have organic nitrogen that builds up in your soil, and we're typically calling this biogeochemical legacy. And you can also have nitrogen or phosphorus uh, in your reservoirs and your stream riparian areas, and that we typically call as network legacy. So one of the goal of our work is to be able to quantify the spatial patterns of these legacies in the landscape. How much is there? What form where? And the next piece of the flux, uh, puzzle is how are they mobilized? So here is where a change in climate becomes really important. Because think about this landscape with legacies and different landscape elements. And then you have an extreme rainfall event that's mobilizing these legacies. And then you, right, then you see it in the stream. So that's when modeling cl uh, changing climate and extreme events uh, to mobilize these legacies become critical. So now if you put all that together, uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our modeling framework. And I wanted to start with uh, asking the question, why another water quality model? Like there are a gazillion and one water quality models out there. Do we need to build another one? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the philosophy. When you think about a watershed model, you think about a watershed as an integrator and an integrator in space. So typical watershed models, we divide our landscape into these homogeneous units, which depending upon which model you uh, belong to, which modeling group you belong to, you could call hydrologic response units, or it can be gridded. And then we accumulate those units to figure out what's happening at the outlet. So it's an integrator in space. However, watersheds are also integrators in time. And we all know that because the water that you take out in your stream might have originated in the watershed many years ago. Sometimes it can be a few decades ago because of your slow groundwater pathways. And that really needs to be taken into account. And most watershed models struggle with that, specifically when we are talking about the decadal time scales, which is relevant for the groundwater travel time. Um, I can go more into the logistics of uh, why that is so, but it's not not the easiest in most watershed water quality models to do these uh, long time scales. And it's because of dynamic land use change and things like that. But to overcome this issue, the way we think about element is instead of thinking about this watershed as just units of equal land use, we think about this watershed being uh, comprised of similar land use trajectories. So the main thing that I want you to take away from here is that the past matters. So let's say I have a plot of land which is forested. Now, from a nitrate perspective, that plot of land, because it's forested, no fertilizers are being added, uh, it will have really low nitrate concentrations. But we say, well, if it was cropped before, and it was recently converted to forest, it will still bleed a lot of, of nitrate. And we need to take that into account. So that's what we do in our model. We take into account the past land use trajectories, and we divide the watershed into units of similar or different land use trajectories, so the past, uh, to account for the past. Apart from that essential difference, it is a process-based model. Uh, the reason it's called Element, it's exploration of long-term nutrient trajectories. And um, we currently, I'm going to talk about nitrogen and then about phosphorus. 
The model is fed with nitrogen surplus, which is calculated from uh, agricultural census databases. Uh, it has an organic nitrogen pool and a mineralization rate. So this is really similar to models like SWOT or HYPE, uh, but a little bit more simplified than that. And then groundwater is explicitly captured using convolution of groundwater travel time distributions to predict nitrogen loading at the catchment outlet. I come from a groundwater hydrology background, so to me, when I came into the world of watershed modeling, to me, representing that subsurface pathway was really important. So now let's see what the model can do for us. So here we started off with two watersheds. One, the Mississippi River Basin, and the other is the Susquehanna River Basin. Two large basins with huge nitrate pro nitrogen problems in US. And what you see over here is the land use trajectories over the last 200 years in these basins. The thing that I want you to note here is very dramatic different land use trajectory. For Mississippi, you have a very dramatic increase in row crop over a small period of time, whereas in the Susquehanna Basin, it's a more gradual land use trajectory. So we took these two basins, we estimated nitrogen surplus in these two basins. I'm not going to go into the, all of the details, but again, this is one of the most painful parts because you have to digitize uh, hard copies of uh, agricultural databases to get these past trajectories. But then these are fed as input in our model, and this is what we get at the outlet. So this is, uh, all, all that you see in red is data, and the gray is model prediction. So this is nitrate load at the outlet of the Mississippi, nitrate load at the outlet of the Susquehanna. Now, of course, we are not trying to predict all the little nuances or climate effects. We are primarily here, our goal is to say, can we capture the general trends of the mean annual nitrate? Um, the big thing that's really interesting over here is that hump in nitrogen load that happened in the early 1900. So the question is, what created that hump? And um, it was really interesting to look at, and one of our hypotheses was the dramatic land use change. So if you think about the landscape that drains into the Mississippi, it was comprised of prairie grass. And prairie grass, tall, uh, prairie grass had these deep carbon um, soils. When you change that to row crop agriculture, there was a lot of plowing, so a lot of oxidation, and we hypothesized that that's what led to that big influx of nitrate in the system. So how do you go about validating a hypothesis in the 1900s? Thankfully for us, people had taken sediment cores. Sediment cores are this amazing thing where it preserves the past, so they had taken sediment core in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can look at sediment cores and understand the history of productivity in the Gulf based on information that's preserved in the sediment cores. And this is what you see in the sediment core taken in the Gulf. This is pigment concentration over time. What was really, really cool for us is the time that we saw the hump in our modeled values corresponded to the time that there was a hump in the pigment concentration, saying that there was an increase in productivity in the Gulf in that time period. So now moving from Mississippi to Susquehanna, if you remember, the Susquehanna did not have that hump. It was pretty monotonically increasing nitrate load. And again, there's people that had taken sediment cores in the Chesapeake Bay, and it doesn't have the hump. It has the monotonically increasing um, productivity in the bay. So this led us to believe, well, we at least have captured the last 200 years adequately well using your model. So now, what do we do with a model like this? So one of the things that is really useful uh, for a model like this is predicting things like groundwater nitrogen accumulation. And here again, my background in groundwater, I get really excited. Is this a way we can get estimates of groundwater nitrate accumulation? Current work in our group is focusing on getting data and being able to both validate some of these estimates, but also uh, make the model better by using that as an additional um, data source uh, that we can validate against. But then we put all that together and say, well, I started out asking the question, how long will it take for the water quality to improve? And can we ta may, uh, may take a shot at answering this question? And in case of the Mississippi River Basin, what our model results told us is to achieve the 60% reduction, and this is what the Gulf of Mexico Task Force said we should, 100% reduction in nitrogen surplus is needed, and it will take 35 years to achieve the change. Of course, 
that 35 years is subject to huge amounts of uncertainty. And um, the other thing that our model did not consider yet is the role of downstream controls like wetlands and other uh, water bodies to, to mitigate some of that. Here we are only talking about nutrient management in the soil. However, this gives us an idea that it is not something that's going to happen in three years. It is a decadal time scale that the water quality will take to improve. Okay, I'm going to jump nutrients on you now. So moving from the story of nitrogen to the story of phosphorus, uh, we developed a phosphorus version of the model. Um, and again, similar idea, phosphorus surplus is what feeds the model. And uh, in, in the soil, this is very similar to the hype model where you have an active and a protected pool and a mineral pool of phosphorus. The big difference with phosphorus is erosion is a big component and there is also retention of phosphorus in reservoirs and riparian areas. Um, there's also the groundwater piece, and then we get the phosphorus loading at the catchment outlet. So the phosphorus model we applied in the Grand River watershed, and generally uh, in the area that we have data, our model uh, performed adequately well. This huge peak that you see is a function of, that's when the detergent bands happen. So phosphorus was really high here because phosphorus from um, dishwashing, soap, and detergent was a big component of this budget. And this is when the first algal blooms in La Lake Erie appeared, which led to bans on detergent. And that's what caused the big decrease. The really interesting thing that models like this give us, again, where is this phosphorus hiding? So similar to um, the nitrate story, here we see there's a lot of phosphorus that is hiding in the soil. And this we kind of know, but this allows us to quantify it. And also currently we are working on using soil databases to see if we can validate some of these numbers. The other thing that's really important, just in terms of magnitude, to understand that since 1900, of the phosphorus surplus in the landscape, so the net phosphorus input in the landscape, only 4% of that has come out in our rivers. So 96% is still tied up in legacy. So when we think of solving the phosphorus problem, we have to think about that 96% that we have to tackle in some way. Um, the other thing that you note over here is that even though it's much less than the soil amount, there is a significant amount of phosphorus that has accumulated in our reservoirs and riparian areas. And the reason that's important is that even though it's a smaller amount, it's more concentrated. So it's much easier to manage a few reservoirs than every farmer's field. So this is something we need to think about. And the other piece to us what's interesting is can we validate these estimates independently? So with the reservoirs, what we wanted to do in order to validate is take sediment cores in reservoirs. So here you see uh, one of two of my students taking a sediment cores in one of the reservoirs in the Grand, the Bellwood Reservoir. Now again, the sediment cores are amazing. They give you a sneak back into the past. And in this case, uh, we used uh, uh, lead 210 dating uh, to estimate the sedimentation rate of the reservoirs. And did some numbers there, and what it, what it led to is that the reservoir was accumulating phosphorus at a rate of 38 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare of upstream area. So let's now see how our model did. So what you see on the top is uh, the sediment data, and on the bottom is the model prediction. So this is a model that's capturing the effect of all six reservoirs in the watershed. So it's a very macro scale model, but we got similar ballpark estimate of reservoir phosphorus accumulation, even with a very simplistic approach. So future work on developing element involves making it more spe spatially explicit in this watershed, which is work we are already doing, but then also uh, adjusting adjusting the parameters so we get better at um, matching these different components of the model. Those of you who model know that one of the big problems with hydrologic modeling is the problem of equifinality, where you can have many combination of parameters and um, that will give you the same outcome. So having these different data sets to validate our model independently helps us uh, trust our model results a little bit more. So now moving from that again, 
we try to predict how long it will take. And in this case, we find that to achieve the 40% reduction in phosphorus load, we need 100% reduction in surplus, 50% wastewater treatment plant upgrades, and 25 years uh, to achieve that improvement. This is really preliminary results, not been published yet. Um, so, so we are working on finishing up uh, these scenarios. Okay. So work moving forward in our group is now extending this work uh, both, both in space, so we are modeling catchments in, in uh, Europe um, as well as other catchments in North America, thinking about nitrogen and phosphorus together, but also uh, linking the work with economists and social scientists thinking about how, what does legacy uh, and time lags to water quality improvement mean from an economic perspective. Okay. So that is essentially the other work we are doing is also we are we are thinking about coupling we are talking of coupling element model which is this long time scale with more finer time scale models uh, for the current scenario and then we will be able to say what is the role of extreme events in in these pulses of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, moving through our landscape. So pieces, different pieces of that, but uh, the long time scale, we will focus on the analysis being more coarse, uh, and the shorter time scales, uh, it will be finer analysis. I'm now going to jump into, for the last 15 minutes, to talk about this world of solutions. And uh, the main thing that I want to do to take away from this piece of our work is uh, that there's a huge amount of research that has been done in any of these areas. So nutrient management, wetlands, reservoirs, riparian areas. Our take at this, this realm of the solution space is to think about the question of scale. How can we scale up our understanding of any of these processes from a small wetland to a landscape or wetlands, or from a small field um, to a landscape? So starting the conversation with nutrient management. And in the world of nutrient management, the first thing that I want you to take note of is thinking about legacy as a resource. So generally, we think of legacy phosphorus as this really bad thing, means it'll take a long time. It's a negative uh, way we, uh, we think about it. But if you think about all this phosphorus that's built up in our soil that we can harvest effectively and thus improve our water quality faster, we can think about it as a resource. And this is work that's been done by Jian Lu and others and Helen Walsh from here where they, uh, they looked at data from, uh, from soil plots and they saw that you can apply much, much less phosphorus and still get the same crop yields and improve water quality at the same time. So we can draw down those phosphorus levels in the soil. We just need the right policy levers and incentive structures for farmers to be willing to do that. And of course, we also can do cover crops that can pull up some of the legacy phosphorus too. So we can do that. We just need to figure out the right way too. The other lever that we've been uh, really interested in in the last uh, year or so is the idea of uh, manure. So one of the things our data analysis and modeling in um, the Great Lakes Basin showed us is that manure is a significant source of nutrients in, uh, in water quality problems. And the reason is as follows. If you think about agriculture, even 50, 60 years ago, we had these small farms and small livestock operations. So manure from the livestock operations used to be applied as fertilizer to the crops, and it was a tightly knit closed system. Now we have large farms and large livestock operations. So manure from the livestock operations, manure is really costly to transport because there's a lot of water in it, it's, it's not easy. So manure from the livestock operations can be really applied to the crops uh, according to their needs, so a lot of it is dumped on the ground. I don't know about here, but in Waterloo, if you drive around uh, in winter, you can smell it, and farmers have dumped it on the snow all over. And here's this huge amount of phosphorus that's sitting there ready to pollute the water quality. So can we think about doing something to address this issue? And on a local scale, I mean, there's, there's technologies out there. There's, there's uh, ways to think about recycling uh, manure uh, in terms of crop, crop application, but there's also potential of generating biogas from manure. So killing kind of two birds with the stone, the same stone where you can get an economic benefit out of a biogas plant as well as have greenhouse gas benefits. And there are, there are farmers and dairy farmers that are doing biogas generation in their, um, 
in their operations, but it's not, still not very ubiquitous. And we need it to be way more ubiquitous to be, to be useful. What we are doing, again, this is putting our modeling hat on, is across uh, large regional areas, we are trying to develop an optimization algorithm to see what are the trade-offs, costs and benefits associated with either transporting manure or using it for biogas, and can we optimize the system? Uh, and when you have excess manure uh, left on in the field, what does it mean from a water quality benef uh, perspective? Um, Again, what are the costs and benefits associated with it? So what this, in our, what this needs is more larger scale policy levers to make it more feasible at the larger scale to have biogas plants, more incentive structure to do that. The technology, a lot of it does exist. Okay, now I'm going to jump topics on another solution scape. And this is probably the one where we've done uh, the most work in the in the past years. So this is uh, thinking about wetlands. So we all know wetlands are amazing. They retain nutrients and they protect downstream waters. Um, the work in our group has focused on primarily thinking about wetlandscapes. So if you think about a landscape and this is the best group to talk about this because you know way about this than, uh, than I do, is landscape comprised of many, many wetlands, small and large. How do these landscapes look? How have humans changed these landscapes? And what does that mean in terms of ecosystem services provided by the wet landscape? And for our case, the main ecosystem service that I'll talk about is water quality improvement. So we started this work when I was in Iowa. And, uh, and this is uh, the tail end of the prairie landscape that a lot of you have been studying. Um, and this is the Des Moines lobe in Iowa. So this is really, really impacted, meaning 90 to 95% of it has been, con the prairie wetlands here have been converted by tile drains to row crop agriculture. What we did in this landscape, so this is the Des Moines lobe where we studied, what we did in the, this landscape is we tried to compare how humans have changed wetlandscapes. So we used LIDAR data and a combination of LIDAR data and uh, soil data to identify historical wetlands, and then we compared that to current wetlands. So this is what we found. So if you look at historical wetlands, you find a really nice power law relationship where you have many more small wetlands and much fewer large wetlands. However, if you look at current wetlands, which is in blue, uh, what you see, of course, there is a decrease in number of wetlands. But what's more interesting is this little yellow area over here, though it looks little, think about it, it's the log scale. So we have preferentially lost the smaller wetlands. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, if there is a small puddle on the landscape that doesn't have water all throughout the year, what is the chances that it will get either paved over or converted into agricultural land? So small wetlands gets lost first. And when you're thinking about, and also there is wetland consolidation, when you're thinking about restoring wetlands, you also always want to restore the larger wetlands because they feel more like wetlands. So because of this, you've seen a lot of small wetland loss. And since then, others have worked in um, other parts of North America, and the finding about the small wetland loss has been pretty ubiquitous. So now you ask the question, okay, we've lost a lot of small wetlands. What does this mean in terms of the wetlandscape? So we ask the question, what is the role of wetland size in nutrient removal? And what does this mean in terms of the nutrient removal potential of the wetlandscape? So for this study that was led by my graduate student, Fred, uh, we, looked, we did a meta-analysis of 600 water bodies related to nitrogen and phosphorus retention. And we found from each of these water bodies what is the nitrogen and phosphorus retention. The biggest thing that we found is small wetlands have faster denitrification kinetics than larger wetlands. If some of you are fam familiar with the stream literature, this is well known in the stream literature, that small streams are more efficient processes of nutrients than larger rivers. And why is that? So the biggest reason that happens is because there is more sediment, less water in a small wetland, whereas a large wetland has more water, less sediment. This is pure geometry. So what we did was to prove this hypothesis, we developed a simple sediment water interaction model, and then we applied simple geometry to say as you increase the size of the wetland, everything else remaining the same, do you see a different denit effective denitrification kinetics? And indeed, we found that to be true. So now taking that together and saying, what does that mean in terms of the nitrogen removal potential of a wetlandscape? So here, 
we are looking at losing wetlands. So there's on the right all your wetlands in the system. So we lose the smaller wetlands first in the landscape. So here we see when you lose 50% of your wetlands, you're losing more than 80% of the denitrification potential of the landscape. Whereas in contrast, when you're losing larger wetlands first, by losing 50% of the area, you're losing a much smaller fraction of the denitrification potential. So I'm not saying one small wetland is better than one large wetland. What I'm saying is 10 one hectare wetlands remove more nutrients than one 10 hectare wetland. So if you're thinking of consolidating the wetlands, think about the role of that size in its nutrient retention potential. So of course, size is not the only story. There's a lot of other things, right? What is the connectivity of the wetland? What is the landscape position of the wetland? What kind of wetland? So what we are talking about in this, in this review paper is that we really need to put the, keep these in, in mind. We really need to think what are the wetland re restoration targets at the landscape scale, and what does that mean in uh, terms of reduction of eutrophication risk? If you want to restore wetlands, which should you restore? And this is actually the question that Iowa Department of Natural Resources asked me first, which is what prompted this entire body of research. They said, we have X amount of money for wetland restoration, but we don't know where to restore it. And that's, that's a big uh, knowledge gap that exists. OK, so last piece, I'm going to talk briefly about another lever in the landscape, which is reservoirs. So reservoirs are, again, this water feature in the landscape that have the potential of changing nutrient dynamics. Here we ask the question, what are the impacts of reservoirs on downstream nutrient ratios across space and time? And can we manage reservoirs to improve downstream water quality? If you think about reservoirs, reservoirs have traditionally been constructed and maintained for flood protection. But if water quality is a concern, can we manage them to protect waters? So, I'm uh, and this is important because if you think about dams and reservoirs, well, they have been increasing uh, across the world at a really sharp rate. So I wanted to give you an example of what I mean by this. So this is a paper that recently got accepted where we looked at water quality data uh, uh, in hundreds of stations across the Great Lakes Basin. I just wanted to give you a little snapshot. So this is two streams in, in Michigan, uh, the Rifle, which is the upstream, and the Muskegon, which is downstream. If you look at the land use in these two, uh, at these two locations, it's pretty similar. So pretty similar land use. And what I'm going to show you is water quality data and stream flow data at these two locations. So first, this is the upstream location. So the blue is the stream flow. Yellow is the soluble reactive phosphorus, or the dissolved phosphorus. And you see they're very much in phase with each other. Uh, stream flow is high in April or so, and you have a peak in soluble phosphorus right around that time. Now let's look at the downstream station. You see there's a complete flip. If in that short distance here, your stream flow and your phosphorus is completely out of phase with each other. Right? You have high phosphorus concentrations coming out in the summer months. And why does that happen? Well, the reservoirs are depleted in oxygen in summer because algae are growing. They are sinking to the bottom of the reservoir. And low oxygen concentrations uh, starts releasing phosphorus from the bottom sediments of the reservoir. And that leads to higher phosphorus concentrations in the summer months when algae love it most. So we also wanted to, so summer concentrations of soluble phosphorus increases downstream of a reservoir. So now think of a landscape made up of many, many reservoirs, and you ask the question, what role do these reservoirs have in changing my phosphorus dynamics? We most of the time don't consider that in our watershed models. We wanted to look at this further in, uh, again, the Bellwood Reservoirs, which I've talked about before. And the Bellwood Reservoir is interesting from a practical standpoint because this is an example of a reservoir that the Grand River Conservation Agency have been having a lot of problems with in the last few years. There's been algal blooms pretty much every year in this reservoir. And one of the questions we ask is, why is that happening? Let's look at phosphorus inputs to the Bellwood Lake. And if you look at phosphorus inputs in the stream that's coming into Bellwood Lake, well, phosphorus is decreasing. So if phosphorus is decreasing, why are algal blooms getting worse? And here again, uh, and this is also visible, uh, this is sediment core data in the reservoirs, and you see a 200% increase in chlorophyll A and a 100% increase in cyanobacterial pigment. This is more recent, this is older. So the reservoir condition is really getting worse, despite the fact it's not about phosphorus. Phosphorus into the reservoir is decreasing. 
And our hypothesis in this case is there's this tight feedback loop in the reservoir where you have sediment that is releasing phosphorus to the water column. Algae is uh, growing on it. And when the algae die, they, they are cycling back into the sediment. And they are creating anoxia because when the algae degrade, there's oxygen consumption. And when you have low oxygen levels, that really prompts a lot more of the release of the sorbed phosphorus into the dissolved form. And you create this tight feedback loop. And probably this, coupled with the fact of warming temperatures, is what's causing these increasing algal blooms in these reservoirs. So thus, we are now developing reservoir models, coupling with the watershed models. And overall, again, bringing back to the same question, if reservoir management could be changed to improve water quality, what about the role between top-drawn and bottom-drawn reservoirs? Does that have a role to play in how it impacts downstream water quality? Can we manage our reservoirs better? So to summarize, if you're thinking about this large scale, thinking about how do we manage watersheds to mitigate algal blooms, the first piece of the puzzle, which is a lot of the research of our groups, is that there are lag times, and you have to quantify lag times and adjust expectation. Nutrient management is important because if there is legacy, legacy is a resource, and that resource could be tapped into to improve water quality faster. Um, and we have to be smart about it. We don't have infinite resources, so we really have to target our resources to areas from where, which have the shortest travel time to our outlets so that we can see the fastest improvements in water quality. Um, we need to think about not only farm scale management, but wetlands and reservoirs, downstream levers that we can manage to improve the water quality. And we have to think about all of them in tandem. It's not a silver bullet. We have to think about all of them together to have a cohesive way of managing our downstream waters. With that, I would like to thank you for your time. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, I'm pretty active on Twitter, and that's my email. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nandi. This was a great talk. So we have time for questions. You go first. Thanks for that awesome talk. Thank you. Um, I was really interested in your wetlands and from the perspective of consolidation. Um, so the small wetlands are more effective. Have you any ideas how you could make the larger wetlands more effective? So because they're, they're more useful in an agricultural landscape. Right. So how can we manage the larger wetlands to denitrify as much as the smaller ones? That's a really interesting question. So I would think, uh, so the reason small wetlands are more effective is there's more sediment surface to water, right? So if we can, and this is going, going into the world of constructed wetlands, so if we can create more uh, sediment surfaces, I think that's one way of making, making larger wetlands uh, more effective. So probably we would have to redesign it some, and also maybe, maybe nutrient management using plants. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Really enjoyed your talk. It was uh, it was quite good, and of course, it's a massive problem in the, on the prairies and for many researchers here. The um, I was very interested when you were using the lidar DEM to look at the changes in the wetlands, and uh, but I, I didn't quite catch how you got the historical change with lidar because usually lidar is very recent. Yes. So so the hypothesis, and there's there's the hypothesis that we started out with that is that the so in, in the Iowa landscape, there's a lot of depressional areas that are tile drain for agriculture. So the, mm -hmm. the kind of assumption or the hypothesis was is that there's not a huge amount of filling of these historical wetlands ha that has happened. So okay. we is and, and uh, also we uh, intersecting the intersected the lidar data set with soil data set. So if there, there if there is a depression and that depression has a particular soil type which is typical of wetlands, then we say that that is a historical wetland. The the caveat to that is that if there's been if, if there's been filling of the wetland over time due to uh, just sedimentation, then we'd miss. So if anything, our historical wetlands is an us underestimate. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, yeah. it's such a, it's a conundrum for us as well. Um, and uh, did, do they drain with ditches in Iowa? Yeah, so they drain with tile surface inlets, tiles, and then ditches, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So the other one goes back to the um, uh, large versus small wetlands and their impact. And, and um, what we found in the Canadian prairies, because you have variable contributing areas is that the larger wetlands, particularly those at the bottom of the flow sequence, have much more impact on the water quantity flow off a basin than do the smaller wetlands. Right, and right. 
how do you think we can reconcile that sort of hydrological conclusion with the uh, with the phosphorus uh, conclusion th that you have, which is which is really retaining the smaller wetlands. Right, right. No, so we actually, and I've not shown this, we actually developed a simple model and kind of saw the same. So if you're talking about flood control, and there is one paper that came out uh, that talked about that. So if you're talking about flood control, it is the larger wetland that are the gatekeeper wetlands, and they have the biggest impact. If you're talking about water quality, it's different. And, and I think at the end of the day, we have to figure out a way to manage these trade-offs and maybe we have to think about a mix of both kinds of wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see very easily in, because the water retention doesn't depend on the sediment area, it just depends on the geometry of the system, so the larger wetlands, you, uh, the smaller wetlands spill over faster, so of course the flood impact will be greater. Um, okay, so yeah. no, it's interesting. It's this, that's a really good, difficult topic for GWF to address. <laughs> So I'll, I'll just just on that note, so one of the things that was really interesting for us, so so broadly speaking, different wetland sizes have different ecosystem services, whether they be flood retention or, and one of the earlier conversations that we were having with somebody at Ducks Unlimited, and he was making the point, we want the size of the wetlands that the ducks like. So what is the size you want to preserve, which, which, yeah, and, and, uh, and it has to be a distribution, but I don't think we have a good answer on what that distribution is. Question in the back. Thank yes. you for the great presentation. Um, as you know, most of the uh, phosphorus that is in the manure is not used by the crops. Mm -hmm. So if hypothetically we were able to replace all the manure with like the uh, artificial fertilizer, do you think that would be beneficial? Like instead of using manure, you just use the fertilizer, artificial fertilizer? So I think the bigger question is what do we do with the manure? Right, our, our problem is we generate too much manure and we need, I mean, so we need a way to dispose of the manure. So if I think about uh, in terms of uh, importance, so manure does have value in terms of crop health because it has a lot of organic matter, but there's risks of manure because there's, um, there's risks of bacterial contamination and other things from manure application. Um, so, but even then, if you apply not too much manure. What we do now is apply too much manure. Uh, so, so I think we first have to uh, figure out what to do with this extra manure we are generating, whether we apply it to the soil, which would be good, if we convert it, figure out an economic way to convert it all to biogas and then get phosphorus, more inorganic phosphorus out of that and apply it for fertilizers, maybe that is better. Uh, so it's, 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 not an easy, it's not an easy question. I think the big question is there is a ton of manure generated that we don't. The thing is that um, the no tillage practice has shown that it like has negative effect in like leaching of uh, phosphorus. Yes as opposed to for nitrogen or like particulate phosphorus is positive. Right. So is this like global like or is just like, I don't know globally if this is the problem? It's true in a lot of cases and this again brings the straight off, right? If you do, if you till, you'll get more particulate and more erosion. If you do no till, you'll get more dissolved. And again, these are these classic environmental problems. There's no winning and you have to figure out some kind of trade off that's good enough, which is not, not an easy question. Thank you for your Thank presentation. You. Um, when you have a decrease in legacy nitrogen, is there any proportion of that that is lost to the atmosphere and thus increasing greenhouse gas effects? Yes, absolutely. Do you have so a sense what proportion? Um, so it's very spatially variable. Uh, denitrification is one of the toughest to constrain portions of the mass budget in terms of, uh, in terms of kind of global nitrogen budget, right? So uh, so it varies. In our modeling framework, we use it as a calibration parameter uh, to fit the nitrate concentrations at the outlet. Uh, but, uh, but the legacy nitrogen that accumulates is after accounting for uh, the nitrogen surplus Part of it would go to legacy, part of it would go to denitrification and um, nit uh, nitrous oxide, uh, and part of it uh, would go to streams. Um, which part goes, that's what the model kind of uh, tries to deconvolve those pieces. Of course, there's significant uncertainty, and um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
make it quick. Yeah. Sure. Your so uh, thanks for your wonderful pr uh, talk. Uh, so my question relates to the the role of a uh, human diet on managing water quality. So wha what do you think about that in terms of modeling in larger scale? So uh, is there any like uh, recent modeling on larger scale to to see the the role of the role of human diet on water quality management? That's an interesting question. From what I've seen, there is definitely modeling done to say what is the role of diet in terms of water quantity. Uh, I have not seen, I mean, uh, there is definitely a big effect because if you change your diet, uh, you need to grow less crops, less fertilizers, and, but I don't know, I haven't seen a uh, global scale modeling of human diet effect on water quality. Is one more? Thank you so much, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I have a question from kind of the YP perspective. Um, I'm w I was just wondering, do you have any recommendations or kind of words of wisdom for young professionals who are kind of looking to manage um, our career goals or just get into the field? Um, do what you love <laughs> and everything else will work out. That's been my, uh, that's my best advice. Uh, really find your passion, don't do something because you you feel you need to or you need to achieve a goal. Really really figure out what part of science really speaks to you because, I mean, I ha I'm, so I'm speaking a little bit from my experience. I muddled my way through science and did things that really didn't interest me till I found something that kind of hit the spot at the right place. Um, so I, I would say if things are not feeling right, figure out a path that works for you and really enjoy your work. That's the best thing that you can get out of science. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Nandita. So I think on those words of wisdom, it's a good time to close this event. Uh, so before that, I just want to just remind you that next week we're going to have Karen Kidd from McMaster University. Uh, so you just make sure to come back here next week again. So at this point, please welcome, uh, to please join me in thanking Nandita for coming here and giving the great talk. And yeah, she's going to be here for tonight, and then she's leaving in the morning. And thank you all for coming and for inviting me. This was really a great opportunity.